Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Asia Pacific Multi Stakeholder Dialogue on Bodily Autonomy and Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, SRHR. My name is Tamina Kauski, and I will be taking you through all through today's highly anticipated session. We truly hope that you will all leave this dialogue inspired and energized to continue our work in advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights. Before we begin, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to address a few housekeeping rules. Since we have a large group, all the attendees will be on mute except for the designated speakers. At that time, uh, to our speakers, please disable your cameras because this will help save bandwidth and ensure a smooth experience. The closed captions, have also been enabled for those who would prefer English subtitles for this event as well. We're also providing simultaneous international sign language interpretation. As you can see, go right next to me. We encourage you to also use the chat function for any questions or comments, dear attendees. And that's enough of our housekeeping and we're about to kick off. Ladies and gentlemen, the Generation Equality Forum is a civil society-centered, multi-stakeholder, global gathering for gender equality convened by UN Women and co-hosted by the governments of Mexico and France in partnership with civil society and youth. Through co-creation, diverse and inclusive consultations, the forum brings together feminist advocates from across the globe to foster action and renew movement for gender equality, as well as to launch a set of innovative and multi-stakeholder Action Coalition. Now, a little bit of background information. The Generation Equality Forum commenced in Mexico City, Mexico from the 29th to the 31st of March, 2021, and will culminate in Paris, France, later this month. As a global movement for urgent action and accountability for gender equality, the forum promotes systemic and transformative change to accelerate the implementation of the historic Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and leads to gender equality, resilience, and sustainability in a world still affected by COVID-19. Sign language interpretation for today's session is provided by the Malaysia Federation of the Deaf, NFD, and we're joined by interpreter Sulengo. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to call upon His Excellency, Mr. Roland Galharagu, French Ambassador to Malaysia, to deliver his opening remarks. Your Excellency, good afternoon. The virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, Tamina, and good afternoon to all. I would also want to thank the uh, International Planned Parenthood Federation for convening this discussion, which uh, I am very happy to open. France has made gender equality its national priority for the duration of the term of the current president starting in 2017 till 22. We believe that gender equality is key, obviously in terms of justice and fairness, but also in terms of social and economic efficiency. So while we are pushing this agenda at home, we're also trying to push it internationally through what we call a feminist diplomacy. A feminist diplomacy means that we are trying to mainstream gender equality in all international forums and in all international issues. We did this, for instance, when we had the presidency of the G7. So this is to explain why we have decided uh, to co-host and co-chair uh, the Generation Equality Forum together with Mexico, uh, an event which uh, is convened by UN Women. We were very encouraged by the success of the pre-summit in Mexico in March, and we are now looking at the uh, final summit in Paris at the end of uh, this month, from the 30th of June to the 2nd of July. As you know, uh, the goal of the forum is to come up with concrete, ambitious and inclusive solutions to key challenges to gender equality. 
To do this, we are trying to build what we've called action coalitions in six fields, and let me quote them. First is gender-based violence. Second, economic justice and rights. Three, bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights, our topic for today. Four, feminist action for climate justice. Five, technology and innovation for gender equality. And six, last but not least, feminist movements and leadership. So when it comes to sexual health and reproductive health and rights, France has identified three priorities to be discussed at the Paris summit. The three priorities are, one, the need for a comprehensive sexuality education that empowers young people. For instance, in France, sexual education is compulsory in French schools, but it's, we are still faced with uh, resistances, cultural resistances from the part of some families. So how do we overcome these resistances? The second priority is to improve the availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality of contraception and abortion services. For instance, what is the impact of the pandemic on the right to access to abortion? Do we need to perhaps extend the delays, for instance, as we did, for instance, in France, we decided to extend medical access to abortion uh, nine weeks after the last period instead of seven weeks. And the third priority is to identify what is needed in terms of political and social measures for girls and women to gain complete control over their bodies. So how do we fight female genital mutilation? How do we fight sexual harassment and make it uncool? How do we deal with period poverty and other similar issues? So we hope that participants in the Paris Summit will help us come up with positive ideas and proposals to advance gender equality. And we are looking forward to your participation. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a very fruitful discussion. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. A very insightful way to frame the far-reaching impact of achieving gender equality for women and girls' rights to bodily autonomy and SRHR, particularly as globally we are still impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we now move towards setting the scene for the dialogue session that is highly anticipated for today. We will now have the privilege of hearing firsthand from each one of our stellar lineup of feminist advocates and experts. Please allow me to introduce them all at this juncture. Joining us today from all corners of the Asia Pacific are our esteemed speakers, Upala Devi, Regional Gender Technical Advisor with UNFCA APRO. Hello, Upala. Tomoko Fukada. Regional Director with IPPF East and Southeast Asia and Oceania Region. Hello, everyone. Tomoko is also joined by Sivananti Panatiran, Executive Director with the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, Arrow. Good afternoon, Sivananti. Good afternoon. We're also joined by Suraksha Giri, a youth activist from Nepal. Hi, Suraksha. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, good morning from Nepal and good afternoon to everyone. <laughs> Lovely to have you with us. And last but not least, Salai Korobusser, Director for Women, Ministry of Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation with the Government of the Republic of Fiji, joining us from Fiji. Hello, Salai. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Bolivinaka, distinguished uh, panelists, your Excellency. Greetings from PG. Wonderful to have you all with us. So, attendees, just to inform you of the flow and the structure moving forward, we will begin with each of our speakers taking the floor for around five to seven minutes to present their essential work in the arena of bodily autonomy and SRHR, all despite the ongoing pandemic. After which, I'll have the privilege of leading a discussion on how best to accelerate their transformative work. 
A note to all our attendees, once again, we welcome your thoughtful questions and comments directed towards the speakers throughout the session, and we will address as many as possible during the Q&A towards the end. The chat box visually on the right side of your screen is naturally for this purpose. A gentle reminder also now to our speakers to kindly mute yourself when That's you're not it. speaking. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to call upon firstly Upala Devi, Regional Gender Technical Advisor with the United Nations Population Fund, Asia Pacific Regional Office. Now, Upala is based at UNFPA's Asia Pacific Regional Office and is joining us from Bangkok with a vast portfolio of experience in working on development issues over the last 20 years. Upala has spoken at, among various other high profile engagements, the US Department of State, the US Senate, and Howard John F. Kennedy School. Today, Upala is joining us to share an overview of the Action Coalition, the areas of concern that it seeks to address, as well as, of course, the strategies and tactics identified to tackle them. Upala, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Moderator. And, uh... Honorable, Your Excellency, Honorable Ronald Galhande, uh, my panel of distinguished fellow panelists, uh, friends, colleagues, and participants. It gives me great honor today to be uh, at this first ever Asia Pacific regional gathering for the Global Action Coalition on Bodily Autonomy and SRHR under the auspices of the Gender Equality Forum. What I'm going to do is just take around five to six minutes to run over an overview of what the Gender Equality Forum is all about. What is the Global Action Coalition on this particular issue? And what do we do in terms of making commitments moving forward? I do have a PowerPoint that I want to share and let's see if I can do it. Uh, okay. So let me go there. So can you see my slides? Yes. Hola, right. please make in the presentation. Yes, I'm trying to do that. Uh, to do that, I should be going towards the... Uh, all right, great. So welcome once again. And uh, so what really uh, are... Honorable Excellency, the Ambassador has already spoken about the Gender Equality Forum, which is really a civil society centered global gathering for gender equality and women's empowerment and girls' empowerment rights. It's convened by UN Women and co chaired by France and Mexico with the close partnership with the Global Civil Society Advisory Group as a part of the commemoration of the Beijing Plus 25 anniversary events. So what's the Gender Equality Forum and what are the action coalitions around the forum? Gender Equality Forum really aims to set the foundation for a renewed era of women and girls' rights that accelerates progress towards achieving gender equality and women's empowerment towards a global movement of building collaborative partnerships. And these are the partnerships which are main, namely in the form of the action coalitions that we are convening here under today. So as our Honorable Excellency the Ambassador alluded to, there are six global action coalitions. The first is the Coalition on Gender-Based Violence. We have one on Economic Justice and Rights. The third is on Bodily Autonomy and Sexual Reproductive Rights, the one that we're convening here today in the region. We have one on Feminist Action for Climate Change, Technology and Innovation for Gender Equality, and last is on Feminist Movements and Leadership. We also have a compact, a compact on women, peace and security which is not a coalition per se, but which sort of cross cuts across the different coalitions because the work on women, peace and security, particularly in a crisis setting is paramount across the world that the coalitions are set to undertake. So what is the Action Coalition Body Autonomy and SRHR? Uh, I come from the UN Population Fund, UNFPA, and for UNFPA, who is a co-convener 
of this global action coalition along with IPPF and ARO. It's really an opportunity for UNFP to advocate and reaffirm the, inform the importance of the International Conference for Population and Development Program of Action for achieving gender equality within the context of, of course, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Decade of Action, and at this point, Paramount is the work that's in addressing COVID response and recovery. So who are the co-leaders of the bodily action, of the action coalition bodily autonomy in SRHR? Along with UNFPA, we have France, Argentina, Denmark, Burkina Faso, North Macedonia, and the Global Philanthropy Facility for Women, Girls, and Adolescents as uh, members. We also have from the civil society and Arrow, which is the part today. We have the clients that brought it sought Sante. We have the IPPF, the International Plan Para Federation, the Foundation Para Estadio Investigal, Commission for Indigenous Children, and Children's Investment Fund Foundation. The uh, Global Coalition on Body Autonomy and SRHR is founded on four pillars and uh, our excellency the ambassador did allude to the four pillars they are really uh, looking at how women and girls in the first pillar really looks at how women and girls in all the diversity are empowered to exercise the sexual reproductive health and rights and make autonomous decisions about their bodies free from coercion violence and discrimination the second looks at how comprehensive sexual education including SRHR education and information and services are freely available, accessible, acceptable, and of high quality. And that women, girls, and feminist organization networks and the allies are strengthened to advance SRHR. And that more governments globally promote, protect, and invest in SRHR, including as part of their overall national universal health coverage schemes. Working across, uh, working across multiple stakeholders and action coalitions and at different levels, we try and transform gender and social norms, promote gender equality, applying an intersectional, intercultural, human rights-based approach to improve SRHR outcomes under the leaving no one behind paradigm. And finally, the fourth pillar is really on supporting the participation of autonomous feminist organizations, including girl-led and indigenous organizations, women's human rights defenders, and peace builders, networks, and movements working to promote and protect bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive rights. So what really needs to change globally? As all of us who are a part of this discussion and have convened here today know, worldwide, it's 45% of women and girls aged between 15 and 49 who are married or are in unions that cannot access and make their own decisions about sexual and reproductive health and rights. They cannot decide about healthcare, contraception, family planning, and their own sexual practices, including saying no to sex. And this scenario assumes a lot of inf importance. And really in this situation right now, where we are in a COVID scenario, where it, the rates of maternal mortality rates are high, as well as adolescent pregnancies, because as we all know, in crisis settings, in humanitarian settings, pregnancy rates do spike. So through the four different pillars of this global action coalition on SRHR and bodily autonomy, what are we trying to do? We are trying to increase SRHR decision-making bodily autonomy. And some of the tactics that we are going to look at is to look at how laws, policies, and practices on the ground can actually enable such access to SRHR decision-making and bodily autonomy including looking at how we can address and change patriarchal and harmful social norms. In terms of expanding the bandwidth, if you will, of comprehensive sexual education, how can you look at increasing delivery of comprehensive sexual education in and out of school, reaching more than 50 million children, adolescents, and youth by the year 2026? And some of the tactics that we can employ or deploy in this regard would look at service delivery, again, addressing harmful social norms, looking at enabling laws and policies, and of course, looking at comprehensive 
quality, accessible education and capacity development for all stakeholders. Increasing the availability, accessibility, acceptability and quality of comprehensive abortion and contraceptive services forms the third pillar of the coalition. And some of the tactics to achieve this availability, accessibility, quality, comprehensive framework would be again through quality service delivery, looking at enabling laws and policies, looking at addressing harmful social norms, looking at financing, really looking at standalone financing for accessing the services and enabling the services, and finally looking at data and accountability. You will see that some of the tactics that we want to employ to reach some of the goals under this coalition are pretty much the same. And finally, when you're looking at strengthening women and girls, feminist organizations and networks, financing and accountability and participation and enabling participation of such networks and organizations would be key. So today in the morning, we just received news that uh, right now, letters of intent to become commitment makers and leaders for this particular action coalition is open and will be open till the 18th of June. And they're really looking, really looking at two different ways by which you can be a commitment maker or a leader. Leaders are those who are primarily member states and are limited in numbers and have to make five-year commitments. And the selection process is through a formal letter of intent submission and the selection will be determined by Generation Equality Core Group. Commitment makers could be anybody. Anybody could be a commitment make makers. It could be you, me, civil society organizations, autonomous organizations, community leaders, networks, everybody. And so there is no limit in terms of numbers when you can become a commitment maker. If you want to become a commitment maker, there is however a one year minimum commitment in terms of how you want to make your commitments towards this forum. And again, there will be an online submission which is available on the UN Women website there will be an application validation process that's going to be managed by UN Women, and the selection will be validated by the Action Coalition's leadership structures. And what will be a commitment maker? What will be becoming a commitment maker mean? It means that commitment makers will be making ball and transformative commitments to one or several of the six other, five other action coalitions. You will play a Catholic catalytic role in supporting the implementation monitoring of actions of the different coalitions, and you will be mobilizing your other networks and stakeholders around the action coalition team and blueprint. As I mentioned, anyone can become a commitment maker, and when you become a commitment maker, what does it entail? You look at partnerships, enabling partnerships, you're looking at making some policy commitments, some financial commitments will be of course welcome, advocacy commitments, looking at how you can enable media advocacy, for example, using your social media networks to, to, to make commitments around this, around, this, uh, around this action group, and looking at some programmatic commitments, which is more in terms of what, for example, uh, international civil society organizations, networks, the UN would be undertaking. And the commitments should be path-breaking, should be game-changing, should of course be measurable, both qualitatively and quantitatively quantitatively between a one and the five year framework that we are, that we are uh, looking towards and looking at ideally designed with other stakeholders and partnerships so that we have a huge global brand width of commitment makers working towards a particular cause. So in terms of UNFPA's action plan around this coalition, UNFPA has today at the global level reiterated its commitment to be a commitment maker and call it this action coalition. And our action plan is to use this forum and the action coalition as an opportunity to raise visibility for the International, International Conference of Population Development's Program of Action, to ensure political and financial support for SRHR issues, to link the Nairobi commitments to, gener to the Generation Equality Forum and Action Coalitions, galvanize greater support for comprehensive sexual education, advocate for young women's leadership in efforts to end harmful practices, including child marriage, female genital mutilation, gender bias sex selection and son preference. We need to be, we have decided to be very bold and innovative in our approach towards addressing and reaching the goals of this coalition. And to that extent, we have 
internally as an organization put in place different milestones and forums around which we are going to coalesce around and under. We are trying to ensure linkages to our work on GBV, including to link up with the GBV Action Coalition, that's co-led by UN Women, WH, and other stakeholders. We are trying to ensure coherent communication across UNFPA to speak with one voice, to be informed and to be strategic in approach. Effective organization and UNFP engagement is, is key and has been during the Mexico event that happened in March and is key to the upcoming Paris event that's happening in June and other relevant for us throughout 2021 and beyond. We'll demonstrate the interdependence and reinforcing relationships between gender equality and empowerment and SRHR and between the ICPD Pro of Action and the Beijing Platform of Action. We will position women and girls decision making and body autonomy under the SRHR SDG target 5.6, which is crucial in reaching UNFPA's three transformative results under a strategic plan moving forward. And of course, all of the work under this action coalition will be grounded and centered around UNFPA's programs, mechanisms, primarily UNFPA supplies, our thematic funds, our joint programs on child marriage, FGM, and the Mosako Initiative to Accelerate Maternal Health and Less Adolescent Rights. I'm not going to go into this slide, but just uh, in terms of the Paris Gender Equality Forum that's coming up at the uh, end of this month, uh, the, the forum looks like this in terms of the sessions. There'll be VIPs, it's of course virtual, and there'll be VIPs that are going to do opening sessions, 20 persons face to face, on SRHR education movement right defenders. There'll be two hour sessions for each of the six action coalitions. There'll be thematic sessions, actually 18 all, as when we last counted and the call for proposals are currently out. There'll be some events centering around, you know, cultural and uh, cultural issues, sports issues, uh, team building, uh, coalition building and so on and so forth. And finally, there'll be large meetings to discuss topics moving forward in terms of follow-up actions. So what can commitment makers uh, hope to achieve an impact? You would be looking at advancing gender transformative interventions to achieve bodily autonomy and SRHR. That's of course our primary objective under this uh, coalition. We will try to leverage opportunities to overcome barriers to, expandive com to expanding comprehensive sexual education increasing the availability, acceptability, accessibility, and quality of comprehensive abortion care and services and voluntary contraception would be key. Increasing SRHR decision-making and bodily autonomy, especially through targeting and addressing harmful social and gender norms, looking at enabling policy and legal and legislative change, including to prevent practices like early child and forced marriages and unions and female gender mutilation, other harmful practices like sun preference and gender bias sex selection. And finally, looking at strengthening accountability to and participation enabling and support for autonomous girls, women and families organizations, networks and movements working to promote and protect bodily autonomy and SRHR, not just under this coalition, not just under the Gender Equality Forum, but moving forward between over, over and above the SDGs and beyond. And, and with that, I end my presentation and over to you, Madam Nagarajan. Thank you so much all for participating and listening. Thank you so much, Upala. Thank you, especially for sharing the exciting news that applications for commitment makers are now open all the way till the 17th of June. Also your key insights there, especially regarding what needs to change 45% of women and girls globally being unable to access bodily autonomy and SRHR during the pandemic is certainly a rallying call for our collective action. Next, ladies and gentlemen, our upcoming speakers will each highlight and help unpack these focused action areas so excellently framed by Upala. I would thus like to invite firstly Tomoko Fukuda, Regional Director with the International Planned Parenthood Federation East and Southeast Asia and Oceania region, IPPF ACR. Tomoko is responsible for leadership and management for the work of IPPF in the region, supporting 23 member associations and three 
collaborating partners in a total of 25 countries, all working towards advancing sexual and reproductive health and rights, SRHR. IPPF is also the co-lead of Generation Equality Action Coalition on Bodily Autonomy and SRHR. Tomoko, um, I would love for you to tell us a little more about the need to focus on contraception and SRHR as part of the commitments to SRHR and bodily autonomy, including contraception, safe abortion, laws, and policies. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Tamina, and a uh, warm welcome to all of you who has joined us today. Uh, it's so encouraging to see almost uh, 200 people who have joined us, and I think it shows how uh, deeply we are all committed to advancing the cause. Uh, and this Generation Equality Forum is giving us an opportunity to really push this agenda forward globally and especially in our region. So a uh, warm welcome to everyone. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak um, on especially around contraception and the need for safe abortion. So uh, what I would like to say today would probably be reiterating some of many of the things that have already been said and many of the things that you have already been thinking about. But the power to make choices on one's fertility is so important because it underpins many of the other rights and the benefits run in so many different directions. Um, the right for a woman to girl to make autonomous decisions about her own body and reproductive functions is a very core fundamental right to equality and privacy. Um, if a woman can make her own decisions about sex, for example, who and when to have sex with, uh, contraception, when and how many children to have, she's likely to enjoy um, better health overall. Um, it would also increase opportunities for education. Uh, she may uh, own her own property, be fully employed, uh, have more time for leisure, and um, avoid gender-based violence as well. Um, and if uh, we, we know also that if she is able to make choices about uh, having children, they are more likely to be healthy. So the power to make choices over their own body links directly to poverty, education, hunger, decent work and economic growth, uh, reducing inequalities, which is a good big chunk of all the SDGs goals. Um, that's why contraception is so central uh, to ensuring the well being of a woman. And I think we've all also faced now with the COVID pandemic, the worsening inequalities around the world, how it has, we have heard about how it, it has increased sexual violence. Uh, there are new barriers to accessing uh, healthcare. There is job and education losses. Uh, we have seen how it has really changed and impacted uh, women and girls' lives uh, all around. And this has just added to the challenges that we have are facing today in terms of uh, ensuring access to contraception. So what are the challenges that we face? Um, Definitely and first and foremost, information is not equally available to everyone. Um, and although we live in a very digitized world now and information seems to be more than abundant, uh, still about half of the world's population is offline and they do not have access to digital information. Um, even for those who are online, this can be empowering, but then the volume and content of information can be overwhelming it can be incorrect, it can be misleading. So how can we ensure access to credible and accurate information? And this leads to the conversation uh, later a little bit today around comprehensive sexuality education for young people. Um, how do we ensure that uh, young people are able to get the correct and accurate information early on in their lives so that they can make informed choices about their sexuality, sex, and reproductive health. Um, and uh, also the challenges that we face are around accessibility is becoming extremely diverse. 
uh, I think uh, we it is not uh, simply said to say in one way or another, but women and girls come in all diversities, uh, their ethnicity, their economic status, the places they live, uh, the situations they're in are extremely diverse and ac ensuring access to these services without discrimination is extremely a big challenge that sometimes can go uh, very much unnoticed. People think that it is uh, quite simple, but it is not simple. And I think what we need to do is to unpack the diverse challenges that women and girls face. Uh, and uh, I think this is a part where civil society comes in because uh, we are the ones who are working with the women and girls at the community levels. We know what is the challenges that they face. We know what needs to happen so that they can access these services. Um, that is why it is important for those who are working directly with the women and girls be able to voice and raise these concerns to governments, raise them higher so that the systems can be changed and um, such contraceptive services can be uh, avail available and uh, affordable to uh, everyone. And uh, we easily get caught up in the politicization of safe abortion, um, but I think we must come back to the basics. I think we don't want any woman to have to go through an abortion that's why we are pushing for accessible and affordable contraceptives so that we can prevent unintended pregnancies. But I think what we are saying is that if a woman, because of her diverse situation, opts to terminate a pregnancy, uh, she should not be told what to do by a government. Uh, she should definitely not be jailed because of it. Uh, she should be given the care and help she needs so that she can prevent unintended pregnancies in the future and gain control over her life. Uh, we know that countries where women have the right to terminate pregnancy and are provided with access to information to all methods of contraception have the lowest rates of termination of pregnancy. And it was really encouraging to hear uh, his uh, uh, honorable ambassador inform us about the decision that the French government made in making uh, medical abortion accessible to nine weeks instead of seven weeks and accessing, increasing uh, possibilities of access to services during this COVID pandemic. Uh, so these are the things I think that we, we need to see and uh, see implemented, see actions around in hopes that women and girls are able to access information and supplies in a time contraceptive services in a timely manner. Um, and we need governments to uh, step up and make financial commitments, make sure that uh, sexual and reproductive health services are a part of their universal health core packages that are delivered to the uh, communities. Um, and of course, we need to see that laws and policies uh, ensure that this is able to happen. Um, there are laws that disproportionately impact women, uh, such as laws that criminalize abortion, um, adultery, or sex work. Um, there are also discriminatory laws and policies um, based on sexual orientation or gender identity, migration status, for example. And so uh, we need to make sure that uh, we work and advocate with governments to change these laws and policies to enable uh, a, an environment where women and girls can be supported to access the services. Um, yeah, so I think we need to continue to call on decision makers to urgently correct uh, inequ inequitable access to sexual and reproductive health care and education. Uh, we need to strike down discriminatory laws that are barriers to the full attainment of SRHR. Um, and we need to bring about real change. And uh, we need a well-informed future generation that would help us to do so. And we need this uh, action now. Um, as IPPF, we are committed to working with all partners in the Action Coalition. Um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity today to speak and let's work together to make this a reality. Thank you and back to you, Tamina.
Thank you so much, Tomoko. Um, what really struck me about um, your action area is the fact that you said about information inequality. Um, half the world's population being unable to access correct and accurate information and the consequent ramifications of that on CSE for women and girls. Um, also the emphasis on decriminalizing abortion and destigmatizing and accessing of SRHR overall. Uh, we now move swiftly, ladies and gentlemen, to our next speaker, Shivananti Panathiran, who is Executive Director with the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, or Arrow. Now, Arrow is a feminist organization based in Malaysia and is one of the Generation Equality Forum Action Coalition co-leads on bodily autonomy and SRHR. Siva is a member of the Civil Society Advisory Group to the core group of the Generation Equality Forum. She has also co-authored Arrow's ICPD Plus 16 and ICPD Plus 20 Asia Pacific Monitoring Reports, written numerous articles and presented papers on women's sexual and reproductive health and rights. Jivananji, such a pleasure to have you join us. Uh, we would love to hear from you about creating and maintaining feminist as well as civil society spaces, um, strengthening feminist organizing and participation, plus also the role which feminist and women's organizations can play in accelerating progress, improving accountability and transparency, as well for bodily autonomy and SRHR. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tamina. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Roland, as well as uh, Upala from uh, UNFPA. I hope that Bjarne is also with us. Uh, and uh, of course, Tomoko and her team for organizing this with uh, UNFPA. Uh, Ara is uh, really happy to be part of this wonderful panel. Uh, and um, of course, I mean, it's a reminder to all of us that the feminist movement has been strongly involved uh, in Beijing, as well as the subsequent reviews of Beijing. But not only Beijing, but there's, we also have the shared common agenda with uh, ICPD or the Cairo agenda as well. So um, the feminist movement has been intervening in this international uh, um, document uh, making processes uh, for almost more than uh, 25, 30 years. Um, so 25 years ago, or 26 years ago, the Beijing Platform for Action, you know, when it was launched, you know, it grabbed the imagination of the world and it was, um, you know, grabbed headlines all across the world. And uh, we also hope that that similar momentum is going to be accomplished during this Generation Equality Forum. Um, uh, the Beijing Platform for Action actually kind of focused on 12 chapters, where there was poverty, economy, education, health, politics, environment, and so on and so forth. Um, it was then considered the most comprehensive and resulted in many of the changes uh, and decisions and policies that uh, uh, we now uh, kind of inherit or see uh, taking place at national level. Um, whether it is about uh, political participation of women, uh, women's right to inheritance, uh, women's uh, labor force participation. These are all economic decisions that have been like uh, influenced by uh, the action items set out in the Beijing Platform for Action. Right. Uh, however, still as much as we as the feminist movement really value uh, the Platform for Action, which was created 25 years ago, um, we are also very mindful that the world has really changed uh, drastically uh, and there is a need to actually make uh, the feminist agenda as well as the women's rights agenda very um, rooted in a current uh, reality. And that current reality, which has been uh, reiterated by many of the speakers before me, is uh, one that is, you know, it's a critical, is a world in crisis, uh, so to speak, you know. Uh, and um, we can see that, you know, some of those gaps in uh, um, uh, Beijing were the fact that, you know, sexuality was considered binary, right? Uh, and when youth sexuality was mentioned, it was almost always paired with youth responsibility. Uh, and uh, there is no mention of non-binary bodies or non-binary sexualities. And uh, 25 years later, we can see that the world has grown and uh, changed completely its understanding and its acceptance around these issues. Uh, there were also very few uh, mentions of class 
uh, in the uh, Beijing platform for action. But uh, this is something that has been so deeply rooted even within the SDGs, right? The inequality, the differences between the top uh, 1% and the rest of the bottom 99%. Uh, and uh, that is, of course, something that calls us to actually put again the inequality analysis and again bifurcate that inequality analysis with a class analysis. Uh, there was very little, of course, uh, uh, for those who come from um, the South Asian context. There was very little mention of caste, you know, as an organizing force in society or race. Uh, beyond just an axis of discrimination, that race is an organizing axis within society. Uh, but all of this has you know, exploded uh, into the uh, public discourse and public debate in the last two, three years. So we're very mindful that uh, all of the actions and the commitments that we are making need to be rooted in this type of uh, current context that we have. And, uh, you know, and at the, at the root of it or the heart of this uh, action coalition and the actions that the feminist movement hope to see is the fact that you know, the emphasis on uh, autonomy, the emphasis on choices, the emphasis on decision-making, uh, which are really critical in order to empower uh, women and girls uh, and those who take the identity of women and girls in order to make those decisions about uh, their lives. Because only when we make decisions about our lives can we actually have uh, control over our lives. Um, and uh, uh, because of this uh, feminist organizing, and you know, Tamina, you've already mentioned that the feminist movement had looked at the Generation Equality Forum as the way to actually push forward what we term there's the unfinished agenda of Beijing, right? So across all of the different action coalitions that have been proposed, we can see that, you know, uh, climate justice is a deeply rooted uh, theme that definitely in the global south, that uh, the global south is, uh, you know, suffering from the effects of uh, the overdevelopment of the global north. And we are actually bearing the undue burden. And I'm quite sure that, uh, uh, that you know, our, uh, ambassador from Fiji will actually talk to that uh, because, um, and not only that, that even in the global south, it is the bodies of women and girls and those who take the identity of women and girls who actually su uh, suffer from the disproportionate effects of that, right? So um, we have those themes. We have the themes of economic justice uh, or rather e economic injustice wrought uh, by the neoliberal economic framework, which has been uh, absorbed by the policies, you know, uh, by almost all of our governments in the region. Uh, so in SRHR and bodily autonomy, it's really important for us to really look um, at this uh, issue and look, and that is why those three action areas were very critical to us. We know that after 25, 26 years, every year when we go into the Commission on the Status of Women or the Commission on Population and Development, member states and governments are stalled, you know? And where do they stall? They stall around access to contraceptives for all those who need them, not just those who are married, but actually young people who are uh, vulnerable and marginalized from those services due to either their marital status or the other socioeconomic factors, right? You talked about uh, before because they live in rural areas or they uh, belong to a social, uh, lower social, a socioeconomic status. Um, and then we also see that uh, debates are all, always stalled at the access to safe abortion, right? And the commitment that actually governments made in Beijing was to go one step beyond Cairo and review unjust laws which penalized women. And this is something that has taken, I mean, a number of countries in our region have done it uh, post Beijing. And this would include uh, countries like Nepal. Uh, it would include uh, countries like uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, which have changed their laws uh, to be more progressive. But still, these are too few uh, to mention. And then the other uh, one is, of course, comprehensive sexuality education, which time and again, uh, governments in our region like to uh, term it as a uh, Western agenda, which has been uh, imposed uh, upon us. But we do know that Asia Pacific region has the largest youth demographic. It is absolutely critical for us to be able to uh, empower the young people in our region with the information that is so needed, whether through technology means or uh, through like traditional means both within school and out of school so that they can make the right decisions and choose for themselves and they have those options to do so in order to 
uh, get along with their lives and make the right. Uh, uh, and so these are some of those uh, unfinished agenda that we were talking about. The third uh, area, of course, was to change uh, gender norms that exist in society. And I think COVID-19 has really kind of put the spotlight on that issue again, because we saw a resurgence of gender-based violence, uh, which again is about gender norms. We saw a resurgence of, or not really a resurgence, I think it was always there, but uh, the work from home situation probably uh, shed light on the fact that many women continue to shoulder you know, uh, the care work in the home scenario. And we are actually one uh, of the regions which have, uh, where women do, I think, four to five times more care work than any other women in the region. So I think that some of those changing of gender norms uh, is absolutely is, uh, essential. So these are the three things, uh, the key areas that we had chosen for uh, um, uh, as action or priority theme areas to go one step further, right? Uh, but of course, as uh, the feminist movement, we're always looking at interlinkages uh, with other intergovernmental documents. Uh, and we can also see that how perhaps some of these actions in uh, the Generation <laughs> Forum are uh, things that we are able to actually look at um, uh, setting the standard or helping advance uh, you know, the Asia Pacific uh, Population Conference, uh, which was held in the region a midterm review was held and as an indicator framework for actually all of the uh, countries in the region to kind of um, uh, adhere to and to look at how we can make movement in the region. Uh, there's of course the high level political forum uh, which takes place in um, um, New York around the sustainable development goals. But we also have our Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development, which kind of looks at how progress between uh, SDG 3 and SDG 5 also can be made. So we actually see the Generation Equality Forum kind of pushing, helping push the boundaries so that the achievements uh, which are more related to health and rights can also be fulfilled within the Sustainable Development Goals as well as um, the uh, ICPD agenda, which is with both the Nairobi commitments and in the region uh, have to do with the Asia Pacific Population Conference. So these are the ways in which uh, uh, we are hoping that uh, the world uh, can be slowly pushed towards uh, making this necessary changes. Thank you so much, Sivananti, for um, correlating the interlinkages of discrimination, all absolutely spot on. Um, it's so true. We've grown and changed incredibly as a global community from ICP Beijing more than 25 years ago to today, actually conscious of intersectional discrimination and working towards addressing each one of these unfinished agendas. Um, COVID may not seem like a silver lining of any sort, but at the same time, it has definitely highlighted all of these discriminations, making it much more likely that this may actually be resolved during our lifetimes. Um, from there, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to our youth advocate, Suraksha Giri, a youth activist from Nepal. Now, Suraksha is an active youth volunteer and youth champion with the Family Planning Association of Nepal, FPAN, the Palpa branch, since 2014. Um, she is currently a member of the PPF Board of Trustees and an executive board youth member with FPAN Province 5. Her work focuses on reducing abortion stigma, providing easy access to safe sexual and reproductive health services. She has taught comprehensive sexuality education, CSE, in several schools, youth clubs, and participated in numerous awareness programs aimed at teenagers and women from underserved communities. Suraksha, um, given your hands-on experience and as a young person, why do you feel the action on CSE is such an important part of this specific action coalition? The floor is yours. Thank you, moderator uh, Tamina, and uh, namaste everyone from Nepal, His Excellency, uh, Excellency panelist, and everyone attending uh, from around the world. And um, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank UNFPA, IPPF, and Generation Equality Forum for having uh, me as a panelist in the, today's program with such an honorable personalities. And um, 
yeah, to answer this question, let me take you together to uh, the journey of my teenage when I was a young girl studying in class eight. And back then I got an opportunity to be part of a comprehensive sexuality education program, which was given by Family Planning Association of Nepal. So it works under the umbrella of IPPF International Planned Parenthood Federation and um, as one of the member association and uh, they have been providing this education to schools out of schools, uh, youth clubs um, and many more. So since a very long uh, time in collaboration with uh, health and population teachers and uh, in support with F fund field workers followed with the cascading model. So um, by the year, it has also been subsequently added to the course as well. And uh, since then, I started my journey as a peer educator to FPA Nepal, um, working with the most vulnerable group uh, with limited access to uh, comprehensive sexuality education as um, by setting the goal, reaching 50 million more adolescents and youth by 2026 and making access in schools and out of schools um, Later in 2018 and 19, I also got an opportunity to work uh, and closely um, see, observe myself as a youth champion in the district, uh, where I got an opportunity to work mostly in the grassroots, uh, local, provincial and national level and uh, with culturally diverse group of communities, uh, adolescents, women and people living with disability, PLHIVs and uh, marginalized and vulnerable communities and advocate for their um, reproductive and health rights. So I realized that youth had to face so much of challenges and um, were stigmatized for seeking health services uh, back then and um, still it's now. And um, yeah, moreover, their views were not addressed and they were excluded from decision making part. And I found out that LGBTIQ plus communities had to face a lot of discriminations and negligence in every sectors that may be health, education, getting citizenship or love relationships and many more. So I want to share you a small case, um, which I remember. Uh, there was a girl from marginalized community who was just 14 years of age and was uh, unknown where to seek help for um, abortion services. And uh, one of her friends who was our peer educator brought her to FPA where uh, the doctor found out that uh, it was already 13 weeks of pregnancy and she was scared and she explained how she was like unknown of um, all of these and had no idea of uh, comprehensive sexuality education. And uh, luckily from the journal hospital with her parents, uh, she got the second trimester service from the help of um, FPN. So later she continued with her studies as well. Um, um, she also joined as a peer educator in our organization. So other case was also a case of a student in a rural area who were like unknown about uh, even a minor health and reproductive information, despite being a student of secondary um, level uh, class and because uh, the teacher had skipped their, these topics. So this kind of real story touched me and tells that there are so many gaps in the countries, not just in Nepal, but now as working uh, as a board of trustee in IPPF, uh, working globally, I now know that there has been a gap in many developed and developing countries as well around the world. So children are still unaware of good touch and bad touch and um, should know that it comes under the uh, CSA education and uh, how important it is. And obviously we should overcome all of these challenges and I believe together as a youth weekend. So um, to support us, I would like to humbly request to the planners, activists, investors, global parental organizations like UNFPA, global health organizations such as UN, WHO, um, government and health assistance and different type of coalition partners, CSO and stakeholders in sensitizing and to addressing the gaps uh, to make access uh, of CSE in the uh, poor, marginalized, uh, socially exclusive and underserved communities. And um, for this, obviously we need some strategies and me at, as a youth just can recommend some tricky uh, ways for this such as to make access of comprehensive sexuality education by conducting more and more trainings uh, to the youth groups and advocating to integrate 
CAC in the formal education curriculum as well. Secondly, uh, making the youth-friendly services, health delivery centers, uh, make available services in the morning and in the evening time, as well as in the um, holiday time as well, because they're the school going um, youths and adolescents and um, they don't get time maybe during the daytime and they, they have been highly stigmatized. So they, they might uh, be yeah searching for such kind of service. And a third as a production of audio and visual learning materials as, uh, and also in the Braille Lippies uh, to differently abled people. And um, fourth would be, um, yeah, collecting different ideas and perceptions of um, culturally diverse communities would be very effective for CSE uh, to realize as an important part of life. And fifth would be globally uh, advocating CSE in the music and sports as youth loves it. And uh, in today's generation, they are more into it. And in the special tournaments, by applying different methods. Uh, and the final, last but not the least, disseminating CSE by advertising in most um, popular social medias uh, that youngsters follow uh, these days, uh, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. So. Um, so here now, I call on a young people to play an active role in advancing the gender equality and reproductive right as a church barrier of ICPT and global goals. And having said this, um, to summarize in one sentence as my quote, I would like to say that um, if we stand in solidarity and uh, be one voice, we can achieve our goal uh, by 2026. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Saraksha. CSE is definitely such an essential element in ensuring girls' bodily autonomy and SRHR. Your rationalizations and evidence-based observations are priceless. We also really appreciate your heartfelt sharing of youth cases, um, the critical gaps and life-changing impacts of having timely access to SRHR. From there, ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to our final speaker before beginning the panel discussion with all of the speakers before. I have the pleasure now of introducing Salai Korobusir, Director for Women, Ministry of Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation with the Government of the Republic of Fiji. Salai, ladies and gentlemen, has served in a number of agencies within the Fijian government. Her areas of expertise are in research and policy, planning, human resource training and development, productivity and excellence. She has worked extensively with programs that promote disaster risk management, women's development, and gender equality. Um, Salai, we would be so fortunate to glean your insights on making and keeping commitments to gender equality, particularly the role played by your government in making commitments to the cause of SRHR and gender equality, as well as to strengthen gender responsiveness of the COVID-19 response and recovery process. The floor is yours, Salai. Thank you, uh, Madam, Mod uh, Madam Moderator Nbulavinaka and greetings from uh, Fiji. Um, allow me first to start by wishing you and your loved ones uh, good health uh, this evening. Um, so excellencies and distinguished fellow panelists and guests, um, I'm honored to be part of this important panel uh, of the Asia Pacific Multi-Stakeholder Dialogue on Bodily Autonomy and um, SRHR. And of course, um, uh, its response and recovery so on behalf of uh, the Fiji government, I would like to extend our appreciation to um, IPPF and UNFPA through our Reproductive and Family Health Association here in Fiji uh, for their continued partnership and support and helping us move forward uh, towards the goal of gender equality and of course the empowerment of all women and girls, not only in Fiji, but in the Pacific. I guess uh, by now most of us would have experienced firsthand how um, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our lives, our ability to leave home, our work and to, uh, to go to school or to access public and health and social services. For me, um, I had to make special arrangements to be part of this program uh, as uh, working from home uh, would not allow me to um, participate in such a um, virtual uh, discussions. But I'm, I'm really fortunate and I'm honored to be part of this program. And of course, we know these impacts are not the same for everyone. For Fijian women, uh, uh, Fijian women here are making significant and 
critical contributions to um, address this uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Fiji as key frontline responders. And this is um, counting doctors, the nurses, the lab workers, the midwives, social workers, even the hospital cleaners, the market vendors, our supermarket clerks, the quarantine workers, and primary caregivers at home. 63% of our health workers and 85% of our market vendors in Fiji are women, placing them at increased risk and exposure to infection. For us, women in Fiji are also overrepresented in the sectors and jobs which are hardest hit by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The tourism and hospitality industry, uh, retail, handicraft, manufacturing, and the most common, uh, most vulnerable types of employment with the least protection, such as workers in the informal employment, including the self-employed, our domestic workers, daily wage workers, and contributing family workers. You will know that global data confirms that since the outbreak of um, the COVID-19 pandemic, reports on violence against women and girls, particularly domestic violence, has increased across the world. In Fiji, there has been two, there has been to a significant and alarming increase in calls to our domestic violence national helplines. Uh, Fijian women and girls, like other parts of the world, have unique, unique health needs over the, their life cycle. But they also, and they also have limited access to quality health um, healthcare, counting sexual and reproductive health and rights, the services and information, access to the information, reproductive cancers are diagnosed and treatments uh, treatments and others. The restrictive social norms that we have and gender stereotypes also limit our Fijian women and girls the ability to access these health services. Uh, these um, Pre-existing limitations at the time of COVID-19 pandemic has, without a doubt, um, affected quality and the, and the availability of sexual and reproductive health rights services, placing women, adolescent girls, and the most uh, as more, most vulnerable and at risk. I would like to highlight that the Fijian government recognizes that the gendered impact of COVID-19. Um, uh, um, and we is prioritizing the importance of gender responsive national response and recovery plans in fighting effects. Uh, our the Department for Women under our Ministry of Women, Children and Poverty Alleviation uh, has been working closely with uh, stakeholders. And I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, what the distinguished uh, panelist um, Tomoko uh, had mentioned in her discussion the, the, and um, recognizing the critical contributions of civil societies and NGOs who uh, have uh, worked with and are working with the uh, other grassroots women and girls. And it's critical also for government to hear and listen to civil society organizations. So for us here, uh, for the Ministry of the National Women's Mach Machinery, uh, working closely with the relevant stakeholders in advocating and coordinating responses uh, that meet immediate needs of all, all women and girls, including SRHR issues, and our work to ensure that we reach those left furthest behind, also while safeguarding and leveraging gains made on gender equality and women and girls' rights. So uh, for us uh, at the National Women's Machinery, working with them, coordinating with them, uh, listening to them is critical, as, as I said, at the, in Fiji, the National Women's Mission is quite small, so um, uh, it's critical that we reach out and listen to our, our partners that work with uh, the grassroots women and girls. So our efforts are really aimed to place all women and girls at the center of policy and national response, to be able to build capacity of uh, key service providers, to improve the quality of services and response, strengthen the services for women who experience violence during COVID-19 and build a strong advocacy and awareness uh, about increased violence against women as well as sexual and reproductive health rights uh, risks, while also support the distribution of dignity tickets and SRHR information, which I know as uh, our um, youth advocate had mentioned, uh, and also making use of all the platforms available to get uh, all this information out. So some of the key actions that uh, Fiji has undertaken 
uh, has included the, uh, the formation of a gender and COVID-19 working group uh, and the development of a gender and COVID-19 guidance note, which has been noted by our Fijian cabinet and highlights the gendered impacts of COVID-19 in Fiji on selected sectors and the important issues such as SRHR and violence against women and girls with brief analysis. We also saw the formulation of a gender-based violence working group under our safety and protection um, cluster system here in Fiji. Uh, and this is of course to rapidly advance prevention and response against violence uh, um, on violence against women and girls. So the GBV working group rapidly has developed information, education and communication materials uh, such as resource kits and virtual trainings for our frontline health care workers community workers and helpline, uh, social welfare and other frontline GBV uh, responders. So this is some of the works that we felt was critical, especially when people were uh, working from home or under uh, lockdown uh, and they couldn't move. So accessing this information was, uh, was also critical, even uh, getting them, uh, giving them awareness on how they can um, access services through just a phone call or messages. So during this process, we were reminded, uh, one, that no single act or intervention can address the entire range of issues that contribute around women and girls' health and safety, and SRHR in particular, in the context of COVID-19. Two was that there are data gaps that accurately um, uh, reflect the realities and complexities of women and girls' lives. Uh, that, that, and this is, of course, what we see uh, um, is a hindering challenge. On that note, uh, and in conclusion, I would like to underline that data and evidence for us here in Fiji remains one of the most critical gaps uh, for planning and implementing and reporting on women and girls' sexual and reproductive health and rights issue, not only in Fiji again, but also in the Pacific. We need to be able to collect and use data to change attitudes to inform policies while moving towards achieving the goal of gender equality and of course the empowerment of all women and girls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salai. We truly appreciate your presence and also highlighting the multifarious gendered impact of COVID-19 on Fijian women, not only with regards to bodily autonomy and SRHR. As you mentioned, 63% um, of health workers, 85% of market vendors are women in Fiji. Women also form the core of sectors hardest hit by the pandemic, retail, tourism, and related industries, the informally employed. Um, regionally and globally, this also does resonate. Such statistics will show up similarly and repeatedly some real food for thought there. And uh, we also at this juncture hope that our attendees are keying in with their thoughts and questions for our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now welcome back all our speakers joining us for the panel discussion on the main screen. Welcome back everyone, Upala, Tomoko, Silananti, Saraksha, as well as of course, Salai. All right, everyone, uh, wonderful to have you with us here again. Um, let's begin by addressing a couple of the audience questions uh, from the attendees which have been coming in. I have one here firstly for Upala. Uh, Upala, for those organizations that have been approved to be commitment makers, what is the best way to connect with the AC's leads and members of this action coalition to form joined up commitments? Is there a way to collaborate on the creation of specific commitments between now and mid-June? The submission deadline. I think this is a very, very important question. And what uh, uh, we can do at the end of this uh, end of the session is to share our coordinates uh, through the chat box with uh, all who are a part of this event today, so that they can directly get in touch with us, uh, and and we can look at exploring coalescing around partnerships, looking at whether, for example. Uh, anybody would like to partner with UNFPA and UN Women, WHO, and so on and so forth. And we could also ensure to make the linkages from the UN. And I guess the same would then go for uh, those who would like to be a part of civil society networks, 
um, speaking with one voice. So for example, coordinating with IPPF colleagues, with Aero colleagues. So one of the ways to do that would be that we share our contacts and coordinates at the end of the event with, with all those who are present so that they can you know, uh, explore uh, channels of communication with all of us who are a part of this event today, who are the co-leads of the Section Coalition. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Upala. I think it's very important to stay cognizant of the fact that the channels of communication are not just open, but encouraged. Um, from there, um, this question um, could be directed towards uh, either Tomoko or Siva, and it asks, how do we connect the talk on making laws and international standards more with the need to focus on effective implementation and inclusion, including alliance building, and in particular, usage of community legal empowerment initiatives, and strengthening of effective alliances between legal rights or health rights, as well as organizations working on women and trans rights. Tomoku, do you want to go first or do you, should I go first? Either or is fine, maybe. Yeah, so um, definitely this is something that uh, um, is really critical because um, as NGOs, we all work with utilizing international standards as well as legal frameworks in order to hold governments accountable, right? To the rights of uh, citizens. Um, and I think that uh, there have actually been a lot of uh, work being done around community empowerment initiatives. Uh, I do remember that uh, there are a few uh, organizations who uh, work uh, very, very diligently on making sure uh, the recommendations made to governments either through the CIDAW framework or the UPR framework is then translated at community level, what it means for the community and um, how do I say disseminated to the community so that the community knows what their rights are uh, and as well as holding the government to actually reporting on the progress towards that, you know? So I think that that's where uh, some of uh, the dots can be connected between um, all three. Um, I feel like uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, we have not, uh, I mean, all movements, all organizations may not have been uh, inclusive as we uh, would have hoped uh, that we could be, right? Uh, so definitely uh, in the global north, we can definitely see a cleavage between perhaps the feminist organizations or the women's rights organizations with trans-led organizations, right? Um, and even within uh, the SRHR movement, there's always been like uh, more conservative elements who have not, not always been uh, on access to safe abortion uh, based on uh, women's right to choose, you know? So uh, I think that almost always that alliance building needs to be geared towards holding up the highest standards and the highest values and the highest principles around sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, and for that, a lot of conversation, internal conversation also, you know, may need to take place in order for that to happen. So yeah, that's all mine. Yeah, thank you. Thank may. you so much, Siva. Absolutely. Please go ahead, Tomoko. Okay. Uh, to, to build on what Siva uh, has just mentioned, and uh, I feel like uh, in the SRHR community, we get together when we have big events like this. So we're now here together towards the Generation Equality Forum, but we lack the platform and to come together at national levels and regional levels on a regular basis. And so linking to this uh, question around alliance building, I think this is extremely key uh, as also Siva mentioned, for us to be able to be a one voice at the national level. If we work in our own space and we do work with communities, but if we don't have that access and channel to governments, how can our voices then be translated into policies and systems and strategies? So. Uh, that alliance building, I think, is lacking, and I think we also need to collectively work with uh, potential donors uh, globally or in the region to really fund and provide financial support to uh, women's groups, feminist groups, uh, organizations who are working in this space of SRHR um, to build platforms and uh, alliances for SRHR. So when I look at uh, myself and the work we do in IPPF, uh, we are a federation of member associations, 
uh, across 25 countries in, in East and Southeast Asia. And then with my colleagues in South Asia, we are, we are more than 30 countries uh, in this region. But why just link together member associations? Uh, why not IPPF be the platform to bring together uh, everybody working in this SRHR space? And because the issues are so diverse, we have many, many different organizations working in SRHR, which are small voices alone. But uh, as Sir Kshaya mentioned, when we come together as one voice, we are an extremely strong voice towards governments. So uh, I think this is extremely key and something that we should, we could all work together and actually materialize in the coming year. Absolutely, thank you so much for that, Tomoko. The diversity of experiences and organizations now really is the time to bring that all together as uh, literally a behemoth towards actionable change. Um, from there, I have a question for um, Suraksha. Suraksha, um, delivery of CSE continues to be a challenge and more so during the COVID-19 pandemic related restrictions. Um, how has this affected you and what support do you as a young person need in this time? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Tamina, for this question. Yes, of course, um, like you said, uh, youth has been very much affected uh, due to this COVID and SIHI, they have been affected in um, getting access to health services and uh, getting um, you know, safe abortion sites or uh, getting contraceptions and many more. And um, yeah, so this has been a challenge for sure. And for, um, for people like um, people living with HIVs and disability and LGBTI communities, they have been affected most because of this COVID, what I um, found and what I like um, researched and when I went through uh, medias and all. So um, yeah, so we as an IPPF member, we as a family planning association and other civil society organization, we have been uh, addressing such problems and we have been, I know that um, it's very hard for us to just um, go and work now. And me as a youth advocate, it is very hard for me to as well just uh, go and work outside, but then still the frontline workers who are um, really working hard for this to provide uh, them with a uh, safe, um, access to everything, whatever they're in need of, and um, just uh, respecting their rights and decision making things and everything. So they have been working so hard uh, to get on this um, and uh, protecting their rights and um, and a huge uh, round of uploads to such kind of front uh, uh, frontline workers. They have been working so hard. And uh, other civil society organizations and many of the advocates right now, they have been for sure, such as like Sagitai, he's here, who is in UNFP and many other YPR and Yuva and um, Visible Impact and many more organizations. They have been working so hard in this situation to um, do the online uh, educations for CAC and provide the education for um, disability people with, um, you know, uh, with um, sign languages and many more. Even even in this situation, they have been working so hard, and um, I've been part of that. And um, you know, representing and talking about my country and uh, representing globally. So we have been doing such kind of programs and we have been addressing the voice of um, LGBTI plus Q, uh, Q plus communities. And we have been addressing the voice of um, uh, HIV, P uh, people living with HIV, uh, people be living with disability. And yeah, we have been addressing everyone and re um, just uh, we, are requesting to government and we are taking this voice of them to the government to um, take some actions and yeah, for sure we'll need um, a lot of patience over here, but still, um, despite of all of these situations, we have been working hard um, to be together. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suraksha. It's nothing short of inspiring and uh, really quite mind blowing that you advocates like yourself and organizations are still continuing their work despite all the restrictions and still successfully bringing the services that are so critically required. Um, from there, I have a last question for Salai. So like, um, what you shared was just so insightful. Uh, what do you feel governments can do to be much more gender responsive through the COVID-19 response and recovery and more widely in advancing gender equality from your expertise? 
Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Moderator, and thank you for the question. Well, uh, for us here in Fiji, one thing that the uh, National Women's um, uh, Machinery has embarked on, uh, I guess one of the panelists spoke about uh, transformative agenda. And uh, for us here in Fiji, that's really uh, what we, we've, uh, we, uh, is one of our big um, initiatives uh, with the whole of uh, government approach. Uh, in uh, transformative institutional capacity development. And uh, in, in order for us to be able to uh, have a whole of government approach, this was critical for us. And we are piloting nine agencies in Fiji at the moment uh, to have this uh, transformative um, uh, in, uh, institutional capacity, uh, gender transformative institutional capacity development. So that, uh, that would be one way where we could see that there's a coordinated effort and um, in, in doing this, it's not just uh, the National Women's Machinery uh, conducting short term uh, training and awareness programs, but actually uh, developing officers within these agencies to have that gender perspective uh, uh, in uh, conducting um, gender mainstreaming and looking at their programs and policies that would support the, uh, the empowerment of uh, women and uh, gender equality. And we have focused on quite a number of key agencies across government, starting with uh, uh, and looking at the various sectors. So that that is one way that we feel, and of course, not uh, not only that as whole of government, but also strengthening the, the consultation and collaboration, as I mentioned uh, in 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 my panel discussion, uh, the uh, collaboration and consultation with CSOs and NGOs, and having them as critical partners in in the work that we undertake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salai. I think the fact that you've mentioned our nine pilot agencies in Fiji really speaks to the level of our commitment to agenda actuated response to the pandemic. Um, thank you once again to our panelists. Your insights have really helped frame the action areas and commitments across the board. Um, I really wish we had actually more time to allocate for this um, discussion, but stay conscious of the time factor. I'll now declare our panel sessions closed. Um, thank you once again, speakers. It's been an absolute pleasure having you share your insights and expertise with us. Ladies and gentlemen, moving on now into the last segment of uh, today's program for the dialogue, we now have joining us none other than Bjorn Anderson, Regional Director for UNFCA APRO, to deliver the closing remarks for today's dialogue session. I would also like to remind all our attendees to still please stay logged on after this entire closing is also done because we would love, love to take a group picture with all of you. Thank you so much. Bjorn, please go ahead. Th thank you so much and, and good afternoon from Bangkok. And Your Excellency, distinguished panelists, colleagues and friends joining us from around the Asia Pacific region today. Thank you so much for your inspiring energy and dedication to realizing girls' and women's rights to make choices about their own bodies. As your esteemed panel, as our esteemed panel, and those of you contributing online have illustrated so eloquently, bodily autonomy and decision-making power over sexual and reproductive health and access to essential information and services is a fundamental human right we are all born with. And yet, unacceptably, far too many girls and women are denied these basic birthrights. Specifically, as UNFPA's new State of Work Population Report shows, at least 40% of women and girls in the Asia-Pacific region are robbed of their rights to make simple but extremely consequential choices about their own bodies, about sex, contraception and health care. This violates rights to bodily autonomy, the power and agency to make choices about our own bodies without fear or violence or coercion. It also violates rights to bodily integrity, which is the ability for people to live free from physical acts to which they do not consent. These all two pervasive, pervasive realities are underpinned and per, uh, perpetuated by gender inequality, a profound and persistent norm we must do everything in our power to disrupt. UNFPA has long been working with governments, civil society, and UN partners in Asia and the Pacific to tackle these challenges. Our UNFPA 
supplies program has been providing essential family planning commodities to developing countries, helping women and couples to choose when or if to have children. Our maternal health programs encourage governments to invest in and professionalize midwifery, better ensuring safe pregnancy and childbirth and reducing maternal mortality. Our partnership with UNICEF to end child marriage and female genital mutilation are showing significant results, as is our partnership with UN Women under the so-called UNITE Working Group to tackle the scourge of gender-based violence. And we bring all of these issues together in our humanitarian response, response interventions for women and girls impacted in the world's most disaster-prone region. But we cannot and do not work alone. And that's why today, on behalf of UNFPA and International Planned Parenthood Federation and our partners like Arrow, we are honored to convene such an inspirational change makers, including those of you participating online. Together, we represent a multilateral cross section of actors needed to finally put an end to these violations. From government, civil society, feminists and youth activists, to the UN family, private sector and beyond, we must continue collaborating and holding one another accountable. Collectively, it takes all of our unwavering commitments to be sure that girls and women can make choices about their own bodies. It is with this goal that UNFPA and IPPF, along with France and many other partners, are helping lead the way as co-conveners of the new Action Coalition on bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights. This platform enables us to come together in solidarity to advance the centrality of gender equality in addressing key issues such as integrated sexual and reproductive health services, comprehensive sexuality education, both in and out of school, harmful practices, and adolescent girls and women's decision-making power. This action coalition and today's dialogue stems from the Generation Equality Forum that also builds on the landmark program of action born at the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development, or ICPD. And may the, genera may the Generation Equality Forum and Action Coalition on bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights inspire all of us to do even more of what we are doing here today and within our respective spheres of influence and the communities with which we work. Ultimately, a woman who has control over her body and access to sexual and reproductive health information and services is more likely to be empowered in other ways too. She gains not only in terms of autonomy, but also in her health and emotional well-being education, income, and safety. She is more likely to thrive, and so is her family, her community, and country. And UNFPA is fully committed to co-leading efforts in realizing this important goal in Asia and the Pacific, together with our partners. And thank you for taking this journey with us so all people, including women and girls, can say loud and clear, my body is my own. Thank you so much and over back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bjorn. An excellent summation and reminder of the power of choice and the urgency of achieving gender equality through bodily autonomy and SRHR. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of today's Asia Pacific multi stakeholder dialogue on bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights. We have heard inspirational stories which help frame the aspirational goals of gender equality throughout our region. Thank you for making the time to join us in celebrating the power of activism, feminist solidarity, and youth leadership. And there is no force more transformative than empowering women and girls through bodily autonomy and SRHR. Just imagine 260 million more girls, adolescents, and women in all their diversity, making autonomous decisions about their bodies, sexuality and reproduction by 2026 in at least 20 countries regionally. That is both the vision and the mission. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Tamina Kalji signing off for now. Here's to gender equality, 
gives the generation equality.